Risk Reduction Management Office, and she will be discussing the local government unit's game plan in a valiant battle with the invisible foe. Friends, let us all welcome Engineer Biladi Asur. Okay, Good afternoon, Mom. everyone. Okay, go ahead, Mom. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to share to you the experiences of uh, Ligaspi City in battling the invisible foe which we are now facing right now. I cannot share my presentation. Please wait a while. Hello, ma'am. Can you please yes. flash the presentation? Yeah. I am trying to share my presentation, but it seems that it's not sharing. Wait, wait. I'll try again. Okay. 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 So, so, okay. so I want to start with how we are doing now. Uh, as you all well know that uh, Ligaspi City has uh, COVID cases, which started early, way back in March 15 to 31, during our enhanced community quarantine. So in totality, as you can see from the graph, we had a peak at uh, the, during the period May 1 to 15, we started with one case last March 15. That was a foreigner, an American. So after that, we, we started to, the, the cases started to rise from April with a peak at May 1 to 15. It started with one case from a hot spot in the city, which is an informal settlement. So that's that's where we had a lot of problems. So as you can see, the update for today, we Ligaspi City had a total recorded confirmed cases of 27. We had one death that was uh, one death, a person with comorbidity. He was 70 years old with a combination of diseases. And then from the 27, 17 recovered or was were discharged from the BRTTH. And we have a current number of cases of a total of nine. From this nine, uh, four of them come from that hot spot barangay in the city. All the rest come from the Balik Bayan program of the national government. You know, the, the new incoming strandies. And then as of now, we have a quarantine facility in Ligaspi City. It is currently housing 90 tenants, all of whom are either asymptomatic, repatriated OFW, stranded workers, or students uh, serving quarantine for 14 days. So basing on what we were experiencing, this is what we have before the COVID strike we have a dream age plan existing dream age plan for the city we also have an a contingency plan for disease outbreak and we have existing health systems and public service continuity plan but from among all of these plans we do not have one specific for covid because as we all know covid is a new disease so based on this what did we need then? So we needed the advice of the national government through the national IATF, the guidelines issued by the departments, the likes of DOH, DTI, DILG, and DPWH, of course, the Department of Education. And we needed the standards uh, issued by the DOH for COVID-19. So now based on this minimum health system capacity standards for COVID, these are what we do, what this, the things that we did are this. In terms of health and human resource, we, st we started our activities for COVID as early as February. 
we met with all the stakeholders in the city, preparing them for what might have come due to COVID. So we established the City Epidemiology and Surveillance Unit of the city. Two officers were assigned in that unit. And then we created a city contact tracing team. So based on the standard, we need to have one tracing personnel for every 800 population. But that contact tracing team is composed of 10 members. So it is headed by the chief of police and co-headed by the city health office. The members come from the different offices of the city department, which comes from the social welfare, the DRR office, and other, and other uh, agencies that are related to this. So we also have 70 active Barangay Health Emergency Response Teams. The members of each team, by the way, 70 is equivalent to the 70 barangays that we have. So each Barangay Health Emergency Response Team is composed of at least 10 members. The PHERTs were properly oriented by the Provincial Health Office. They were trained on what to do, the protocols on what to do, what to wear, and what to record. So this is what we did because uh, the BHERTs are our first line of defense at the barangay level. So, and then we also have city health office trained healthcare workers which were assigned at the Legaspi City Community Home Quarantine Facility. By the way, the, whole, the Legaspi City Community Home Quarantine was the first thing that we did in anticipation of the increase of COVID cases in the city. So for this facility, we utilized our Ibalong Centrum for Recreation. It is a, it's an astrodome-like uh, facility which has lots of seats and uh, uh, vast space. So we converted it into a 100 bed capacity community home quarantine. These 100 bed capacity are, are, are located in such a way that those that are asymptomatic or either symptomatic will not be joining together in one place. So they are, it is designed that uh, in such a way that uh, the cases are separated. So it can house as much as 100 beds. So we also have the emergency quick response team, which we were in, we devoted four units of ambulance solely for COVID grants. So the rest of the, of the ambulances are servicing emergency, the usual emergency response. And then we have one devoted vehicle to transport testing lab specimens and other records. And then we made arrangement with, with one of the local funeral parlor and crematorium existing in the city that will cater to all COVID case deaths for the city. So it's, it's embodied in one memorandum of agreement. And then what about supplies and commodities? So it says here that we need to have a buffer of 30 day PPE for all health facilities, not only for the city government of Ligaspi, but also for our partner health facilities and hospitals. Well, of course, the BRTTH, the Bicol Regional Teaching and Training Hospital has its own supply, which comes from the national government. Then we made sure that our partner hospitals and some other clinics have their own supplies of PPEs, aside from those of the city government. So we, we acquired all of these supplies through donations and also through our procurement system. So for the 30 day supply of testing swabs, reagents and testing machines, the city government procured two units of testing machines so that we can help our BRTTH do the swabbing. Uh, so those two testing machines are serving the needs of the Ligaspi city residents. So we, we, we partnered with the BRTTH so that uh, we can already use the machine uh, readily 
and easily because they are the ones accredited to do the testing. The, the, the local government is not yet ready in terms of personnel to do the testing themselves. So we partnered with BRTTH. In terms of organizational plans and processes, of course, the Bicol Regional Training and Teaching Hospital is the accredited hospital in, in our area for COVID cases. So the, the, the strategy that they did was that all COVID cases will be brought to the BRTTH and all other non-COVID cases will be catered to by other the rest of the private and public hospitals existing in the city of in the city of Ligaspi. So all of these hospitals have their triage stations. Of course, the City Health and the Ligaspi City Hospital. The Ligaspi City Hospital is a public primary hospital. So we, we installed triage stations in this area. They are catering to areas that are near within their vicinity. So in terms of utilizing IT scheme for reporting and contact tracing, you know, the laboratory, then the health system database, we utilize IT to facilitate everything that includes video conferencing, the database management system that will account all the contact tracing activities, you know, the, the the people that were admitted at the home quarantine facility. And we also enrolled at the COVID clear uh, IT system, which, which records logistics and assessment. So for, for centralized coordination system, uh, we utilize also the incident command system for COVID-19. So, the incident command system served as the primary system focal point of coordination for command and control. So, and then we also utilize the Barangay Health Emergency Response System, which, which serves as the, as the connection and the link from the barangay to the city level in terms of COVID monitoring and reporting. And then we also have the quarantine control point system, which is housed at the quarantine control facility. And then the, the Ligaspi community home quarantine system. The quarantine control point system refers to the barangay quarantine control uh, protocols installed in each barangay. So for the overall uh, strategy of the city, we, we dwelt with just three critical factors. One is the protocol, which is given to us in the form of issuances and directives and systems coming from the national government, which is relayed to us down at the lower level. And then it is received by the Legaspi City Task Force for COVID-19. So this task force is uh, given the responsibility to localize the issuances and directives that are given by the national IATF. And then we also have the incident command system, which I mentioned earlier that it is the central command coordination and control. This, this is a team where there, there is liaising information relay safety protocols, logistics, and the operations. Under the operations, nandun na po yung implementing arm ng lahat-lahat. So under operations, it is divided into several teams that will implement all of the protocols and issuances given by the city task force and as well as that of the national task force. Then if you, you may be um, surprised with one factor that we, we place, that is humanity, because in the middle of all of these hard and fast rules and protocols and issuances given to us from the national to the lower level, we still want to imbibe that side of being humane in the implementation of all of these fast rules, meaning we provided simplicity in all of the processes and things that we did. For example, we're only required to, 
to give quarantine pa quarantine passes then that's the only thing that we gave we did not issue travel passes during the ECQ time because we want to make it simple for the people. If you are allowed to go out, then you are allowed to go out. You are not required of anything. But then if you are not allowed to go out, then you make use of your quarantine passes. That's all. That's how sim simple we, we implemented things in the city. So... That's all, Paul. That's all. If you want clarifications later, then you can ask. Uh, good good afternoon po. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Doc Malu, ma maray na hapon po sa Saindo Gabos. I've been tasked to share with you uh, the efforts so far what has Naga City done as far as COVID-19 is concerned. It happened to preoccupy my life for the past uh, three months, at least three months. But let me just uh, do this sharing by focusing on at least uh, seven talking points. Uh, let me begin with the first. Uh, one is pointing out that relatively Naga City is small in land area and population. Uh, I, I think this should be a very important point, particularly because when we talk about cities of Metro Manila with their size and with their resources, then you can imagine the difference when you are dealing with a smaller city with uh, lesser resources. So in terms of land area and population so we are relatively uh, smaller okay so that's the that's the first point which is basically saying that even if we are small we have a very porous uh, border in a sense that there are so many exit points and entry points to the city particularly going to our neighboring municipalities the, the second talking point that I'd like to focus on is that the character of the city has been always character. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, it, the city has always been described as a center for transparent, uh, good governance and people's participation. I, in a sense, in the political life of the city, that has been one of the main features of its community. In terms of our public servants, uh, in terms of political leadership. These are people that are, aside from being professional, uh, they are relatively a mature public servants, particularly in terms of constituency services. The second component of that, of course, would be active citizenship. Um, Naga is characterized by people who are so insistent on taking part in governance and doing their share as well. Um, in fact, even disaster and emergency response in Naga has become sort of participatory, wherein communities are literally activated. You have the basic uh, life support training down to the barangay and sectoral levels. You have drivers being trained for first aid, uh, programs like that. So in that context, I move to the third talking point, which is basically the presence of our passionate and committed leaders. We have a hands-on um, local chief executive that is uh, basically validated during the pandemic, uh, particularly during the ECQ period. It was supposed to be the IMT, the incident management team, that is supposed to be receiving the orders. But the responsible official, the mayor himself, 
actually took part in all of the operational daily operational briefings of the incident management team. We also have a Sangguniang Panlunsod uh, that has literally been active even during the pandemic, providing the policy support and even the ordinances that are required, that are requested so that we can immediately enforce and implement even during this time of COVID-19. Not to mention, of course, the offices and the department heads who were basically on board as we were using, like Ligaspi, the incident command system and the IMT is at the helm of all operations. Um, that's talking about the government side. On, in terms of systems, that would be my fourth talking point. We have a proactive and institutionalized mechanisms for handling incidents and emergencies. For example, we have a local health service delivery system that has been in place from the barangay level up to the city level. Moreover, our public and private hospitals are actually embedded in that um, health services delivery system. Also, we have a pool of personnel that has been trained by the Office of Civil Defense particularly on the incident command system, both from the public and the private sector. And all of these personnel are trained up to the all-hazard incident management team or AHIM um, trainings, so that the executive and even the city government can rely on a pool of um, knowledgeable and capable individuals that will run the IMT. To top it off, we also have a, an institutionalized office, particularly in handling the public information work during the pandemic. Information materials are literally made available to the public through various media, through the office that we call the CEPIO. We have the City Events Protocol and Public Information Office that heads the Joint Information Center which incorporated as members all the media outfits and personalities in the city, and they have become a major partner, particularly of the public information officer of our IMT. That is not to mention the professionals that are engaged in our work, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the BHWs, the paramedics, the EMTs, and even the logistical capabilities that were um, shown during this um, crisis. That would include the ambulances, the vehicles that were used uh, during the operations. May I also mention that in Naga City, we have the Naga City Resilience Council. This Naga City Resilience Council is actually a common project of the private and the public sector wherein they come together and during this pandemic, the Resilience Council Secretariat literally provided the tactical support, particularly in handling the GIS maps, the CCTV network, the internet and Wi-Fi services or connectivity, and even the analytics for decision-making during this pandemic. All our quarantine facilities are monitored by 24-7 video surveil surveillance capability. And even our border control um, units are monitored as well with available Wi-Fi and internet services. And finally, uh, one of the most important um, component here is that of our policy discussion uh, group. As we are all preoccupied with actually responding to the medical challenges, we have to look into the economic challenges and other social challenges that are posed by this pandemic. So this policy group deliberated and came up with a recommendation that was later on adopted by the Sangguniang Panlunsod and by the city mayor as part of our economic uh, resilience uh, package. This is basically premised on the assumption that as we battle COVID-19, we have to be ready also to maintain the supply of our, for our economic activities. And enable also the, the demand side. That is, we try to keep the economy going as much as we can. Now, let me now go to the fifth talking point, which is basically the most important for me. Um, this is talking about volunteers' power. Uh, we have hundreds of volunteers 
in the city that literally took part during this operation. They did not scamper away. They did not run away, but they came to assist the city, particularly during its operation. In fact, we have, I think, several hundreds of them working on a 24-hour basis, seven days a week. And they, some of them have worked for more than two months uh, with, with the incident management team. These volunteers actually came from all walks of life, professionals, youth, women, PWD even, and we have several professors and students from the Ateneo Dinaga University who took part as volunteers during this pandemic. So I think this is a very important element that I would like to emphasize here, that as we do the functions of um, addressing this pandemic, people are coming forward to assist. People are coming forward to help. That is why in my next talking point, number six, which is basically dwelling on innovations, I saw several of them that are literally private driven, private sector driven. Just to enumerate some of, of these innovations that we encountered during this pandemic. One would be the MNCCI kitchen, the Metronagat Chamber of Commerce and Industry kitchen that literally ran for more than a month feeding all our volunteers and many of our hospitals and healthcare workers. They were able to generate food supply in, their, in the kitchen that they set up for more than a month, um, assisting us, particularly in providing food for our workers, for our frontliners. So th this is led by the Metronaga Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a private initiative. A second private initiative would be the provision of um, ATM and financial transaction services. Several private banks came forward and brought with them their mobile um, equipment, buses, um, mobile ATM, ATM machines, and other mechanics wherein the people can withdraw cash, can do bank transaction without going to the banks. So they were literally bringing the banks to the, the banking services to the people. The, the third innovation that I would like to mention is that because of, the, because of the stoppage of public transportation, we have so many drivers that literally became um, jobless. We encourage the food delivery services to continue their operations even during the pandemic, of course, observing the necessary health um, precautions. But at the same time, we encourage them to involve the drivers that have been displaced, uh, the tricycle drivers, the jeepney drivers, and employ them in their food delivery uh, services. So far, it worked uh, well. On the government side, we have the market on wheels, um, wherein our Naga City People's Mall literally brought the market to the barangays particularly when we were doing some lockdowns in areas where there are positive cases. So the people will have access to the basic goods, uh, vegetables and others by bringing the market to the vicinity. We, we call that market on wheels. Now, just let me go through at least two more examples of what we have done. Um, the Usually, there's, there's a lot of relief goods coming in or donations coming in in times of crisis. And a lot of groups working together, uh, private organizations doing um, relief operations. What we did in Naga is to try to bring them together and coordinate each of these initiatives so that we can ensure that there will be an observance of the safety protocols and other requirements. And they were clustered in one humanitarian task group being led by the Philippine National Red Cross. So when they do their relief operations, they are assisted and guided in terms of safety. The last example that I would like to cite is that on our decontamination work, uh, we, we have a decontamination task force that literally it's the private sector working on it. You have the Rotary Club um, running their own team 
you have a resort sending out sending out its team doing a disinfection and decontamination activity for the major areas of the city this is great this is a great help particularly to our bureau of fire protection and for the city uh, disinfection team we have i think at least uh, five private groups that were going around the city assisting our constituencies for their disinfection and decontamination need. Anyway, so those were just some of the innovations that, that we experienced during this pandemic. Let me end this sharing by the last talking point, which is basically on the challenges. What are some of these challenges? One is on the limited resources and facilities that the city would have. The new city hospital is in the pipeline, but we have existing uh, health delivery, uh, health services facilities, and we are very glad that we were able, they were able to cope with that. Second, we are hoping for more mechanisms for feedbacking and consultations, particularly among local chief executives um, towards the national and the regional level. We, we are hoping that there would be more uh, opportunity to feedback before the IATF would come up with policies, before the region would impose policies on LGUs. Yeah, just to uh, cite some of this, we, we have written a formal request to the IATF for the extension of ECQ in Naga City because we have cases rising then, but we were that, that request was rejected. Second, we are requesting that the ANCAS uh, be allowed in the locality simply because people have no way of getting around, particularly when you have very limited public services. And we've been told that these are, this will be limited. A third instance would be we were instructed to limit our border control units simply because it is posing as a hindrance. We felt that it's disregarding the need for the locality to protect their constituency, particularly with the inflow of people whom we do not know whether they are infected or not by the virus. So anyway, these are some of the challenges that we would like to put forward in, in this discussion. It is on that note also that I wrap up this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so maraming salamat, uh, Rene. Okay, so it's actually inspiring to take note of those strategies that you shared with us. So you highlighted the practice of having a transparent good governance and people's participation, having passionate and committed leaders, having proactive and institutionalized mechanisms for handling incidents and emergencies. And you also highlighted the presence of volunteers and uh, some innovations. Actually, those innovations that you made mention were also highlighted by our speakers last week when we had the first uh, webinar. So the value of uh, the digital platforms this time that we are having this health crisis. So let us now proceed to the reflections and reactions to be shared by our invited panel of reactors composed of representatives from PSPA, ASPAP, and Ateneo Dinaga University. As mentioned earlier, aside from the reflection, they will be given the chance to raise their question or clarification from our presenters, and they will be allowed to have a follow-up question if there is any. We will start from Dean Ederson Tapia. He is a professor and dean of the College of Continuing, Advanced, and Professional Studies of the University of Makati. Currently, he is serving as the Vice President of the Philippine Society for Public Administration. Just a brief background, PSPA is the only professional organization for public administration in the Philippines that hopes to advance the praxis, study, and practice of public administration and public service in the country through its core program and services to improve the competencies, professional growth and development, networking and partnership building, and policy advocacy in shaping the country's public administration agenda. So friends, let us all welcome Dean Ed. Dean Ed, please. Thank you very much, uh, Doc Malu. Um, I was listening with interest in the two excellent presentations of engineer uh, Milady and uh, E.D. Rene, no? and I think it's what, what 
I appreciate is the fact that really there are valuable innovations at the level of the local government unit that beyond the problems that we normally encounter. Uh, whenever we hear policy pronouncements from the IATF, no? Um, and I guess I like the, the, the identification in the case of Legaspi of the fact that in the middle of all of this is our humanity. Because we've seen that this pandemic has really in more ways than one brought the best and somehow the worst in, in people. We've heard so many stories of this already, no? And um, it's interesting that that that, not, that uh, Legaspi was able to still put it as a policy issue or perhaps a framework in their approach to the pandemic. Now, um, there are certain maybe questions for or reflections that I'd like us to focus on. And I'm approaching this not only from the point of view of, of policy, since I guess both the speakers today were or are in the thick of uh, preparations and in the thick of the battle against COVID. But I'm looking at it also as an academic interest coming as I do from the Philippine Society for Public Administration. And so the questions are both perhaps informed by my, um, my, my academic interest as well as the practical implications of what, what this COVID-19 has to offer to us. The first one, and I, I guess this is very important in the case of, in the experience of NAGA, would be the role of trust issues. Currently in the national, national data that we're confronting us, we could not authoritatively say that we have flattened the curve or things are getting worse or things are, are just the same. We, we cannot say that because the data does not, does not allow us for an intelligent way of approaching the issue. So I guess that highlights somehow a trust issue that people may have towards the health department. Now, we've also seen some trust issues between and among LGUs, no? with some LGUs particularly barricading their boundaries, preventing the entry of other residents from other areas as though they don't have any, any COVID-19 problems of their own. No? And also, there's this distrust towards government in general, even the local government. You hear stories in the city of Manila, for example, where a particular barangay was locked down without, without permission. And so, it is these trust issues which somehow influence the way some people behave. Now, my question is, in the case of Naga and also perhaps in Legaspi, how were you able to foster trust among the people, among the stakeholders, and among the, the private sector so that they could come up with, with um, somehow a coherent approach to, to the pandemic? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, how useful is an interlocal cooperation in addressing this pandemic? We know for a fact that the pandemic does not really recognize territorial boundaries. It's not as though the pandemic can be limited to Naga alone or without going to Pili, etc., etc., or Legazpi alone without going to Tabaco. It does not, simply does not recognize boundaries. No? Were there conflicts between and among LGUs that you've encountered or perhaps even even with local government policies, with the cacophony of so many acronyms that we have right now, GCQ, ECQ, <laughs> some, so, so mga Pilipino, mahili pa magbiro, may barbecue at banana queue at kung ano-ano pang queue. So we, we tend to be confused in the, in the whole process. So is interlocal cooperation any use at all? And the third question, so I have quite a few, and I'm very, very, very interested to hear this. What's the post- GCQ post-COVID-19 scenario plans of the LGUs? Because so far we've been focusing on what we're doing right now, but hey, hopefully, and I think we're all praying that this will end sooner than later. What's going to happen then? Okay, thank you. so yes, uh, thank you, Sir Ed, for that uh, reflection, including questions, actually three questions. So can I request uh, Engineer Ladi to respond, then after Engineer Ladi, we'll have uh, Rene. Okay. Okay, okay. I was only able to note two things from what Sir Ederson has stated, that is regarding trust. So regarding trust, 
Ligas PCT has always made it sure that all communications are open. Open for the, the group of Punong Barangays, open for the group of uh, the Albay Chamber of Commerce and all other stakeholders involved or that may be impacted by the new rules or protocols that are given to us. So for example, we had one barangay lockdown at the height of the ECQ. That was during the period of uh, ending April, the, the peak of our COVID cases. So one barangay lockdown. So how, how, how did the barangay trust us with their life, with their lives, since they are locked down, they cannot go out, they cannot, they cannot buy for their needs. So the key factor is constant communication, always open for communication. So whatever they need, they relate to us. If we are having problems in providing for all of the, those needs, then we, are, we also relay it to them so that we, we were able to work together work together in finding solutions to the problems that are at hand so that's one thing that is that was important for us keeping communications open and involving the, the affected people firsthand before we pronounce lockdown we talk with the barangay first we talk with the punong barangay we, we, we the, the task force is contemplating on locking down the barangay because you had this number of cases so what will be the impact of that lockdown we laid it out to them so this this these are the things that might happen to your barangay so we talk together how to solve the problem the the, the hitches and gaps and everything so that's one thing communication uh, in terms naman of the post gcq scenario that sir ederson has stated well, <laughs> for Ligaspi City, on the side of the, co the government, we wish, we wish that that, uh, that modified GCQ is not yet given to us. We wish that we are still in ECQ on the government side because then things are easier for the government to implement all the rules. But then again, you know, uh, what Mr. Rene said a while ago in his presentation, when you are faced with difficulties and lack of things or lack of resources, innovations come in. So uh, during these difficult times, we, we see the, the camaraderie of people within the community. So our scenario in Ligaspi City post modified GCQ Everybody is out. Everybody is out. They thought that when the government pronounced that we are already in modified GCQ, the virus is no longer there. Some people think that way. So again, the key is one critical factor is constant uh, information dissemination constant information dissemination. You let, let people understand that, hey, even if we are, we are already allowed to go out, we still have to implement these uh, health protocols that is needed so that we can be protected from the virus. So those, those are one of the things that we, we had and we did. Okay, so Salamat, Engineer Ladi. So, uh... Though you failed to respond on the second question about the usefulness of the interlocal cooperation, probably uh, it's already covered in your response about, which is actually uh, uh, related to the value of the of having open and constant communication. Uh, okay, so can I request uh, Rene to respond also on the ones raised by uh, Dean Ed? Yes, uh, I, I would look at the first two questions as strategic, uh, as tactical, from a tactical point of view, and answer the third from a more strategic uh, point of view. The first two, focusing on the trust issues uh, between the people, between those who are governed and those who are in government. I think in Naga City, that was minimized by the 
several or redundant feedback mechanisms or communication platforms between the government and the people. You have, for example, the social media, which can be highly interactive. You have the traditional media that was maximized also. We have several radio stations running 24-7 during that pandemic, uh, broadcasting the developments, including the positive cases and the barangays that were affected. But most important element, I think, is the assurance that the people would see the competence in handling of the, of the cases from case management to contact tracing to uh, quarantine procedure or, or lockdown procedures. We were able to do this by, by simply um, focusing on one, the, the medical component of what we are doing and providing the necessary security uh, support. It's not primary, primarily security, but it's the medical component that was highlighted in the community. We don't put you in a lockdown because we want to punish you. We put you in a lockdown because contact tracing is ongoing and give us several days to complete the process and then we will lift the lockdown even earlier if these people would show negative test results. So these are some of the messaging that were very important so that people in the barangay would not be resistant. In fact, the lockdowns that we did were not really barangay level. It's even down to the zone level or neighborhood level. And most important, we don't leave them by themselves. Um, we bring the market on wheels over there when they are locked down. We bring other relief uh, support to the area when the lockdown is ongoing, giving the people the assurance that the government is there and monitoring and looking into their situation. So I think these are some of the elements that help um, ease the burden, the burden of, of sustaining a lockdown in a limited community for a limited number of days, particularly in the areas that we have had positive cases. So that's on the trust issues. I apologize, it's a very tactical point of view, uh, just, just fresh from my experience in the IMT uh, work. Along the same line also, the second question is on the inter-LGU dynamics. I would be very candid here that th there is a very big challenge for political leaders to pursue policies that can otherwise be very politically unpopular, even during pandemics. So you may be at the risk of losing votes. You may be at the risk of losing the goodwill of your neighbors, of other LGUs. Your, the, the, the mayor next town may be your compadre. But I, I think there is that uh, communication of um, in Naga, we have what we call the Metro Naga Development Council. One challenge for Naga City is that all of these towns and municipalities are very, very closely linked to the city in terms of their economic activities. Unfortunately, when we do the lockdown, we have to close everything. We have to close the border, we have to close the ac minimize the access. So what happened was th there was a meeting of all the mayors in the Metro Naga development area, and they agreed with some protocols to be observed among themselves. Most of them would be very difficult, including the passes, the travel passes from one municipality to the other. Especially when we were um, transformed into the M municip uh, into the moder uh, moderate uh, category, that is the relatively open category. The neighboring municipalities would insist on increasing the access. We have to balance that with maintaining the volume of people that are congregating in our market, in our banks, in our malls. So these are some of the balancing. Uh, acts that the city had to consider. So the formula so that we can sustain the, we will not be damaging the inter-LGU dynamics would be a constant dialogue among the local chief executives. So much so that it's an ongoing um, communication uh, as what was mentioned a while ago about uh, what can be acceptable and what cannot be acceptable. It even came to a point that the border passes released by the city were not anymore issued by the city, but they were issued by the mayors of the towns where the people are coming from. 
so that these local chief executives would have control over the people that are going into Naga. Yung pakiusap lang natin na wag dadagsa yung tao sa lungsod dahil tumataas yung panganib na dala ng pandemya. And so much so with right now, we are now in a modified general community quarantine. So the challenge is back. Our problem with traffic, our problem with the uh, inflow of people from other towns and and municipalities. So the dynamics among LGUs, um, on, on one hand, it became an opportunity to reflect on the relationships, particularly on the economic dynamism of several LG LGUs. We were literally telling them that you have your banks there, you have your market there, maybe it's time that we just talk to the wholesalers and they bring the goods to your own markets, to your own banks, and so that your local economy would be more dynamic and you will not be that dependent on bigger cities or cities such as the uh, Anaga city. And surprisingly, many of the mayors were, were optimistic about this and were also um, positive about their perspective on strengthening their own capability. So the pandemic became an opportunity for reflections as well, even among local chief executives. So th that's on the inter-LGU dynamics. The third and the last is a more strategic um, consideration. I, I mentioned a while ago about our policy team. We call them, we jokingly call them Viral 7 because they're a group of um, our the city planning and development office, our investment board, really thinking about the options that the city will have to consider and will have to face. Right now, we are just in the process of one, stimulating um, or regenerating the demand that most of the industries and sectors, economic sectors had before COVID. So at this point, nagsusubok na magbukas dahan-dahan yung mga hotel, given the guidance of the DOTR. At this point, yung mga mall nag-uumpisang dahan-dahan na magbukas. That's on the supply side. Um, but at the same time, we are also conscious that there are people who lost their jobs. There are people who need to come up again with their spending abilities. So this is another challenge that the city will face after COVID. Um, so we will have to work on that as well. As far as the city government is concerned, we have been instructed to redirect and reorient all our uh, PPAs and all our AIPs to focus on at least three major targets. One is COVID, uh, fighting COVID. The second is the um, encouragement or strengthening of the supply side of the economy. So the city government programs must be promoting that, helping the agriculture sector, helping the other sectors of the economy to revitalize themselves. And the third is more on the enhancement again of the demand side, the capacity, the purchasing capacity of the people, the capacity to um, spend within our locality. So para na, nasa ganoong direction ngayon yung usapin sa loob ng Naga pagkatapos uh, para harapin yung scenario kung sakaling matatapos yung COVID. But again, we are operating on the assumption that this pandemic will be here with us. Um, it's not going away, I think, as far as the national figures are, are concerned. Fortunately for us in Naga, we have had zero case for more than two weeks already more than three weeks already, and we hope to keep it that way. We have activated, the after the demobilization of the incident management team, we now have the Health Emergency Response Task Force that is doing the job for COVID, uh, against COVID-19. Unlike the IMT, wherein we have very strong private and volunteer participation, at this point, it's now the different agencies of the government. It's now the different um, offices in the LGUs, including the DTI and the other uh, DOLE and the other agencies that are supposed to come and help us in, in this situation as well. Okay, so maraming salamat, Ren. So just like hello, the hello. case of the yeah. local government unit of Ligaspi, uh, there's this practice about the feedback mechanism, mechanism between government and uh, the, the people, okay? And also in line with the second uh, question raised by Dean Ed, uh, he emphasized 
about the 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 issuances of protocols, especially that Naga is the one chairing the Metro Naga Development uh, Council. Uh, just to share my na comment nga po noon na uh, uh, pag-aari na ng hindi na pag-aari ng 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 ibang uh, uh, member municipalities ang naga so sa naga lang po talaga because of those uh, uh, issue on the border uh, control then of course the the one highlighted uh, by Rene on the redirection of the AIPs or the annual investment plans and the PPAs or the programs projects and activities okay so let us now move on to the reaction of our Second uh, reactor, so we will have Professor Mitchville uh, Rivera. He will respond to the presentation made by our speakers. Professor Mitchville is from the College of Public Administration of the Pamantasa ng Lunsod ng Valenzuela. He, concur he concurrently serves as the head of the University Relations and Linkages Office advisor of the Supreme Student Council, and board member of the PLB Board of Regents. Currently, he is serving as board member and chair of the Special Projects Committee of the Association of Schools of Public Administration in the Philippines. So friends, let us all welcome Professor Mitch Rivera. Thank you and good afternoon. Dr. Bersaliano, first and foremost, allowed me to congratulate Atenea Denaga. Center for Local Governance for having this kind of webinar. And also congratulations to both outstanding as you, I may say, Legaspi City and Nagaspi. To Director Gomba and uh, both presentation of Engineer Miladi and Director Gomba, the one who took me away is the third partnership and citizens engagement. As we all know, as we fight this pandemic, collaboration is the key. LGU, as we may say, or LGU-led initiative is very much needed to efficiently combat this COVID-19 pandemic. Empowering LGUs are undoubtedly the game changer at this point in time. We need to have a very proactive and responsive local government units from all levels, provinces, cities, municipalities, and barangays, but this will not be possible without the help and support of our constituencies and the public itself. So with that, uh, especially Naga City, we have outlined here the volunteers' power, the citizens' participation. This is very close to my heart because in Valenzuela City, we are very uh, thankful to the sacrifices of our, of our volunteers. Without the help of these volunteers, we will not be able to surpass this pandemic. And we would like to congratulate Naga and Legazpi for doing the same. For the information of everyone, uh, we are from the local government unit also. As we all know, NCR is the center point of the pandemic. In Valenzuela City alone, as of June 3, we have 294 confirmed cases and 13 deaths. And uh, this COVID-related uh, uh, thing enabled our city government to pass at least 53 related ordinances and 43 resolutions from March to May just to address this pandemic. So my first question to take note is about can you cite a major ordinance or resolutions passed by your local uh, legislative body that help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 in your localities? Second is, okay, second question is, during the three months of this uh, enhanced community quarantine, and now we're transitioning to the general community quarantine, there has been a very famous premise in the national capital region, like the voice of the hungry became louder than the voice of those afraid of the disease because of the loss of jobs, because of uh, uh, lack of uh, food of our constituents. Many are now doubting the capability of our LGU. And these people's uh, frustration came in defense of the government response. So. May we know what are the initiatives being taken uh, uh, in action by these LGUs, for example, relief operation, social amelioration, financial assistance to MSMEs or to your, and to your families. And lastly, my question is about what are the best lessons your respective LGUs learned in this ongoing pandemic? Okay. And lastly, my reaction. 
the national government and the Congress may now, may not, may now consider increasing the internal revenue allotment to boost the capability of the LGUs to deliver basic services, as well as augment, augmenting budget allocation to help in disaster risk reduction sector. Thus, imperatives of good governance, in particular transparency and accountability, should be uphold at all times. Again, thank you and congratulations to both LGUs. Okay, so salamat Mitch. We'll have uh, Engineer Ladi first, then uh, after Engineer Ladi, we'll request uh, Rene to respond to the uh, questions uh, raised by, by uh, Professor Mitch. So one has something to do with the ordinance or resolutions passed by the LGUs uh, relative to the, on how to combat this uh, health crisis. Second would be on initiatives, and the last one would be on lessons. Can I request uh, Engineer Ladi to respond to those questions raised by Professor Mitch? Okay. Uh, first, regarding the ordinances or any resolution uh, issued during the COVID, uh, during the time of COVID, well, we did not issue any uh, resolution or ordinance regarding this because we already have existing ordinances for public-private participation and we have existing councils and committees that are that are public and uh, public and private partnership in nature first is that we have an existing and active city disaster risk reduction management and climate change adaptation and mitigation council who have been very active during this time of pandemic they are actually um, members of the incident management team so uh, on the side of the business sector the albay chamber of commerce is also one of the uh, one of the members of this uh, team basically under task force food security so uh, we just made use of our existing ordinances and resolutions that that provided the enabling enabling mechanism for us to do our work during this time of pandemic so in terms of uh, what was the second one initiative yes ma'am oh. uh, the initiatives that that we had new initiatives or new initiatives okay so uh, what we liked most uh, during this time was really the, the public and private partnership was really highlighted during this time of pandemic and it was seen in all of the aspects that uh, that we have done during this time. So one is it is uh, obvious in the incident management team membership, which is composed of the CTDRR and CCAM Council. So uh, back to initiatives. Excuse me. Okay, so walk back to initiatives. One of the many things that that we have done was that uh, the the putting up of our uh, home quarantine facility was one of the things that we we consider as uh, one of the achievements of the city because we 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 did not imagine that we will be able to come up with that facility in such a short short time. And we were able to do it. That was because of the support of the private sector in our area. So the ACCI has a very big role in this. Plus the, the support of the health, private health sector and other business, business organizations in the city. So uh, we literally transformed one facility into another kind which is of very so different in use so we we had to put in resources into that facility so doing it in such a short time cannot be done by the lgu alone so that's one thing that i think we were able to accomplish and then regarding regarding best lessons 
Well, the, the, the participation in itself by all the sectors, all the stakeholders, it's one of the best lessons that we have. It is always good to be working with everyone in the community. So that, that's all. Okay, so sa maraming salamat, Engineer Ladi. So we'll now request Ren to respond to those questions raised by Professor Mitch. Thank you very much for those um, uh, questions. First, in terms of ordinances and resolutions within the city government of Naga, we have, uh, as I have mentioned in the presentation, both our legislative and executive um, branches of the LGU were literally active during the pandemic. And te a testimony, I think, would be the number of ordinances, executive orders, and memorandum circulars that were issued by both uh, agency, by both sector during this uh, time of pandemic. J just to, may, may I just illustrate some, may I just cite some examples. We have ordinance number 2020-018, Naga City Ordinance 2020-018, which authorized the city mayor to impose preemptive community quarantine and related measures as a proactive action against the spread of COVID-19 in Naga City. So the ordinance literally empowered the local chief executive to initiate um, preemptive community quarantine and other measures in the locality. We have ordinance number 2020-019 imposing curfew also in Naga City as part of the COVID-19 preemptive measures. And then we have 2020-029, an ordinance requiring the wearing of face mask or improvised face shield by all persons in public places within the territorial jurisdiction of the city of Naga providing penalties for violations thereof and other purposes. Then another ordinance is 2020-033, an ordinance prohibiting any person from committing any act which causes stigma, disgrace, shame, humiliation, harassment, or otherwise discriminating against suspected, probable, or confirmed person due to coronavirus disease or other human infectious disease and ensuring further protection to doctors, nurses, health workers, emergency personnel, and other frontliners. In other words, this is an ordinance that protects our health workers, our COVID-19 uh, patients, and our frontliners. And a penalty is, is provided as well by the ordinance. Then we have an ordinance 2020-040, an ordinance regulating the operation of pajaks, tricycles, e-trikes, and taxicles during the general community quarantine in Naga City. This is the time when we graduated into GCQ and we allowed trimobiles and pajaks to operate. We limited their passenger to one, but we raised the fee, the fare, to 20 pesos per person. So that, that is an ordinance. Now, in, in terms of court uh, what do you call that? To come up with a comprehensive ordinance, a very recent ordinance has been enacted by the city government, bringing all of these measures together now into one sort of omnibus ordinance, wherein it will be the single guiding ordinance for all our COVID, COVID and other infectious diseases uh, concerns. Now, in terms of executive orders, we have several. We have 2020-012, uh, providing guidelines on work and compensation of government employees during the period of ECQ. 013, 2020-013, organizing the Naga City Management Team for Deceased Patients under investigation and with confirmed coronavirus disease. This is the Task Force on the Management of the Dead. And then another executive order is designating Our Lady of Lourdes Infirmary and the Jesse Robredo Coliseum as treatment centers for PUIs with mild symptoms. And then providing for localized guidelines on the implementation of general community quarantine in Naga City, 2020-015, that's an executive order. And then there are memorandum circulars. In other words, the, the message is simply this. The measures instituted are not whimsical. I mean, not even arbitrary to the IMT or to any other any other unit or offices in the LGU. 
it is always premised on a specific policy statement by the city government. So I, I think that's that uh, uh, that's the environment in terms of ordinances and resolutions as far as Naga is concerned. The second is the question on the seemingly um, polarized choice between um, dying from hunger or dying from the virus. Uh, I, I, I think in Naga City, we had a good mixture of relief operations coming from the national government and those which are instituted by the local government. Of course, we cannot imitate the relief operations by other bigger towns and municipalities and cities with bigger budgets. But as far as the national government is concerned, we, will, we were able to maximize the social amelioration program that was uh, provided. We were also able to access the Bayanihan Fund that was provided, and this was translated into several volumes of rice uh, relief for our people. Now, in terms of local initiatives, there are at least five waves of relief operations already um, conducted. One wave even featured five kilos of rice per person in the area, uh, in the city. The latest wave, the fifth wave right now, um, we are doing a relief operation for the sectoral organizations. So from the Pajak drivers to the Trimobile drivers, whereas the previous relief, relief efforts were focused on territorial or geographic or communities, uh, neighborhoods. This time, the fifth wave is focusing on sectors, the vulnerable sectors. And we hope to initiate more of that in, in the future as, as the quarantine status may, may vary as well. I, I was not able to get the third uh, question that, that was thrown, but if, if I may go to the fourth directly, the era increase. And, and era increase for Naga City would be relatively helpful, but please take note that Naga City has a very low era dependency status. So in other words, the, the local economic enterprises are basically sustaining our operations. We have entered the more than a billion peso budget, annual budget in, in the locality by our own economic enterprises as complemented by the era provided to us. But as they say, any additional fund would greatly impact on our services and on our capacity to improve those services as well. Okay, so maraming salamat, friends. So, uh, Rene made mention about ordinances uh, passed by our legislative, passed by the legislative body of Naga City, including executive uh, orders. He also made mention about uh, the relief operations provided to the constituents of the city to respond to, the, to their economic uh, needs. Earlier, I failed to give you the description of ASPAP. Uh, so for the benefit of our viewers, uh, they might be wondering what ASPAP is all about. ASPAP is a premier professional organization advancing excellence and innovation in PA education and governance that promotes collaboration and co-creation of knowledge, innovation, and good practices among PA schools. It enhances the quality of PA education, research, and services, and networks and partners with PA and government stakeholders for sustained institutional and policy reforms. Okay, so we will now move to the third reactor. So time check, it's 3.20, so we'll request the third uh, reactor to just shorten the, the reflection and reaction and also the question to be raised so that we can also accommodate probably two questions coming from our viewers. So our third reactor is Dr. Marshall Morillo from our university. He is our faculty in the MPA program of the graduate school and at the same time he is also from the Department of Social Sciences under the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Marshall Morillo. Hi, Hi. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Malou, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, I don't think I have a question anymore because some of the questions were already asked by, uh, by, the, by, by, by previous um, reactors. So let me just actually uh, uh, give some of my always um, listening to some of the best practices by the new officers here. They, they, they have a very, very 
with um, a presentation, by the way. So actually, um, the inter this intervention we heard from Legazpi and Agassi represent, uh, represent an unprecedented challenge no, uh, for governments, right? Uh, uh, as we experienced it, no, regardless if you're working with government offices or not, you will understand that the nature of the pandemic, particularly the COVID, um, requiring both short and uh, medium-term policy responses. And we and we, we heard uh, a few minutes ago, um, um, Sir Rene and Engineer Mila D presented a very good um, um, preemptive and during um, um, oriented uh, responses that makes it uh, vital for government and development uh, partners to invest in um, in strengthening of local government, right? So I have here, uh, actually I have here five points, but I will just basically highlight uh, two or three, right? Um, first is uh, initiative of the of both LGU to eliminate um, institutional overlaps. Because um, as far as um, public administration and um, feature is concerned, there needs to be a clear division of functions between obviously the national and local governments between different social sectors as well as various arms of local governments. So because um uh, so textbook is sabi natin we're responding to crisis like this requires clarity in who is doing what, who controls the funds and who makes the critical decisions. Uh, I loud how um, our representative from the gas city mentioned that um, at the heart of this uh, incident or that incident of command system is a very core of humanity that the human side of implementation where they also try to simplify um, the processes which is really really important because when we proceed to my second point um empower citizen, citizens it's, it's really important that they, they actually are uh they, they they recognize the process right away they don't need to like go through um, different uh, processes in order to understand the dynamics of the lgu in terms of responding to a particular crisis like this right so because second point empower citizen if no Local government authority and accountability in policy decisions are addressed openly before the onset and during the pandemic. Um, the individuals, right, tayo, kasama tayo doon, affected both directly and indirectly by public health interventions, uh, will become more familiar with understanding, of course, the, the purpose and challenges of any pandemic related points. Because we know when citizenry is informed about government processes and procedures and also involved in the planning, just like what Nagasit is doing, they, they, they at some sort of uh, 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 people are represented through their Naga People's Council um, and the Naga Metro Development um, uh, 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 group. No? When they're involved, they, when they, are, they know the processes, then the procedures, no? uh, in the, from the planning to the implementation to a certain extent, public administration um, and also public engagements in both theory and execution is obviously, um, will, will, will match, it's consistent, okay? And last point is the moving forward, no, the everyday resilience. I think we, we, we are starting to see already several um, lessons from this, no? Again, textbook, let's go back to the textbook. For a government to work efficiently in the worst of time, it needs to have a well oiled system, practices, no, and resources flows um, in best of times, right? But the system here has needs to be responsive to citizen needs and changing realities. When I say changing realities, we know that um, a pandemic probably will um, ay manganganak ng iba't ibang socioeconomic um, um, problems. No, the job in, job unemployment, the unemployment rate will shoot up. No, the people will be displaced. No, and everything, right? So because crises such as COVID nineteen put huge money and resources into the hands of local authorities. That's why the transfer of power needs to be uh, needs corresponding checks and balances as well. So you have the audits and public um, expenditure reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, basically that's it. I'm, 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 I wish I could only listen to this and, um, um, and ask more questions, but, but because we don't have time anymore, um, Doc Malu, I'll, 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 I'll give it back to you. <laughs> With Engineer Ladi. Um, 
I'm sorry. I was not able to get the the, the question of Dr. Marshall. Sorry, but you were talking about institutional overlaps. Yes. And, yes. Uh, yes. Local yes. And local government accountability. Well, uh, regarding institutional overlaps, uh, you know very well that the uh, the composition of the incident management team is varied according to the different mandates represented by each person. So very clear naman sa amin po kung hanggang saan yung yung duties ng bawat ng bawat agency. So uh, that was why we were assigned according to the operational task force system. We were assigned according to the mandates that we have. Para we made sure that there is no overlap. For example, uh, regarding health, then that should be the city health office. Regarding peace and security, then that's, that is supposed to be the Legazpi City Police Station. So for peace and secure uh, public safety, then that's for the public safety office. So we try to limit the, 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 the bounds of our tasks and responsibilities according to the mandates of the office that we represent. So, so yun po yung ginawa namin under the incident management team. Okay, so maraming salamat, Engineer Ladi. So we'll request Ren to respond also. Sige po. Uh, I, I think uh, what Engineer is trying to point out is very important, particularly in terms of avoiding overlaps. The incident command system is a very effective mechanism for ensuring that during crisis situations, there will only be one accountable person. There will only be one responsible official. So much so that when we talk about my being an incident commander, I am just a commander as far as the job is concerned. The task that are set to be accomplished is concerned. But the ultimate responsibility would come from the responsible official. In our case, would be the mayor who would be giving the instruction and the IMT would be the basically the executive unit that will be performing the task and attaining the objectives that has been set forward. So that, that addresses the overlap concerns. So during emergencies and uh, incidents. On the second point, um, in terms of government uh, doing its functions, I have always looked at the experience as being divided, the, the, the environment of governance as being divided between those who are uh, vested with authority, vested with official um, authority to do their respective tasks, and those who are sharing their point of view, who are giving their suggestion, willing to participate, and giving their opinions. I think there is a very clear delineation between that. When you are mandated to do a task, it is very different from when you are trying to give an opinion. The task, when you fail to do it, would have serious consequences. The opinion, when it does not materialize, the consequences would usually be on the person giving it. But nonetheless, the bottom line always, and I, I think it will always be, the services that we provide to the people. So I, I think this is where it will come in. Whether in a pandemic or not, we have to put the people first. I, I think I, I got this in my graduate school days. Um, David Curtin days, putting people first, the people-centered uh, development. I, and up to this point, I adhere to that. Thank you. Okay, so salamat, uh, Ren. So we'll just time check. It's almost uh, 3.30. So we'll just accommodate one question uh, from the viewers. I'll read the one raised by Daphne Holiday. I am, am I right? I, did I pronounce it right? He's from Indonesia. So to what extent and how could local government units use their discretion in handling the pandemic according to the Bayanihan Act? So can we request the two speakers to respond to this uh, briefly? We'll have first Engineer Ladi. Ma'am, may you please repeat, repeat the question? To what extent and how could local government units use their discretion in handling the pandemic according to the Bayanihan to Heal As One Act? Oh, okay. So I think uh, the, main, the main basis for that is 
Of course, the powers that are vested on the local government units based on the local government code, of course, we have to dwell within within the, the scope of that uh, uh, issuance. But, but then again, I think we can, we can do some innovations along the way. Uh, yun na nga yung nangyari, di ba? Uh, along the way, merong mga LGUs that were called attention dahil some tend to overdo things like the implementation of the barangay control points, you know? We, we also encountered problems like that in some of our barangays. So we called the attention of, of, these, of the barangay officials. But then again, uh, I think it, it, will be, it will be good if the national, uh, the national IATF, when giving issuances, uh, it should come with uh, specific specific rules and regulations so that the LGUs can live within the bounds of those regulations. But then again, just as I have said, we do not limit, we cannot limit our, our, our creativity and innovation along the way. So uh, I think we just have to dwell with with the fact that we can innovate, we can be creative, but well within the bounds of the issuances and uh, directives given by the national government. Okay, so salamat Engineer Ladi. So we'll have Ren, we'll request Ren to respond to the question raised by our uh, viewer. The, the question is basically to what extent and how could we... local government units use their discretion yeah. in handling the pandemic? Um, a guiding principle that has been given to us by our mayor is that we are primarily accountable to our people. In our case, we are primarily accountable to the Nagenios. So what will be needed to protect our people should be done. That, it, that is how I think the extent should be measured. But of course, that is not saying that we cannot be constrained, that there are no limits. We have the national guidelines that we will have to adhere to, that we are all subject to. But the difference is that sometimes the national level could come in very slow when we are facing the actual situations. Uh, when we have communities, when we have individuals that are positive, and we have communities that are afraid, we have to act immediately. And sometimes when you wait for national policies to materialize, it, it may take some time. So it is at that point that some of the discretion or some of the opportunities for innovations may come in. But beyond that, I think we are all limited by the national government, the local government units are subject to this. We are in, in that hierarchy. So the, the leeway is very limited for local government units. Thank you. Yes, uh, maraming salamat, uh, Ren. So, there are questions raised by our viewers, uh, but I think most of them have been covered already by the two speakers. If we can find uh, questions or clarifications which are that significant and would need response coming from our uh, speakers, we will send them via email and we'll just send it back in terms of the responses to our uh, to the one who raised the question. We don't have time, so in as much that we would like to accommodate all questions or clarifications, the time would not allow us to do so. So we will now proceed to the awarding of the certificate of appreciation to our speakers and reactors, and allow me to read the citation. Sateneo Dinaga University, Center for Local Governance in coordination with the Graduate School, Master in Business Administration, and Master in Public Administration cluster, and in partnership with the Association of Schools of Public Administration in the Philippines, and the Philippine Society for Public Administration awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Engineer Milady N. Asur for unselfishly sharing her time, knowledge, and expertise as a, as a resource speaker during the webinar, Tara, Mag-TikTok Tayo, Bayanihan of LGUs Against COVID-19 Pandemic, held on June 5, 2020, from 2 o'clock until 3.30 in the afternoon. Signed, yours truly. So same certificate 
uh, is given to Mr. Rene Gumba of the Public Safety uh, Office. Okay. We also have a certificate of appreciation to our three reactors. First, we have Dean, uh, certificate of appreciation for Dean Ederson de los Trino Tapia. So for unselfishly sharing his time, knowledge, and expertise as a reactor during the webinar, then the same certificate is given to uh, Assistant Professor Mitchville Rivera and also to Dr. Marshall uh, Morillo. So maraming salama to our, to our speakers and uh, reactors and also for our viewers and participants. So thank you for joining us in this online activity. For our participants, as uh, mentioned, as I think flashed in our screen uh, earlier, the guidelines uh, 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 tells us that you will only be given e-certificate if you have registered, if you have confirmed your attendance, and if you will be filling out the the, the online evaluation form uh, in which the link will be uh, flashed uh, on screen uh, later. So on behalf of the Ateneo Dinaga University Center for Local Governance and the Graduate School, together with ASPAP and PSPA, my sincerest thanks to our speakers and to our reactors for sharing significant inputs and for their time this afternoon. Also, Maraming salamat to our viewers for joining us in this online activity. Just to share from our end, we are using one of the facilities of our university library, which is now redesigned to be used this time for interactive virtual discussions and sessions. This is the first in Bicol. And with this, our thanks to our university librarian, Ms. Edna San Buenaventura. So this formally ends our webinar. Again, just mabalos and good day, everyone.